just say quickly that I've known Donna close to 20 years now. Oh my God. And uh, uh, we have uh, worked in different countries around the world. We spent a lot of time actually working in Sri Lanka on the, the peace process almost 18 years ago. Um, and Donna had worked there previously, and we'll tell you more about her experience working in other peace processes around the world. Donna's been affiliated with Harvard for a long time um, and worked a lot with Herb Kelman, who is one of the pioneers. He's a social psychologist by training, but designing what's called the human needs approach uh, in conflict resolution and reconciliation. And Donna has been a key contributor to that. No matter what conflicts I've been working on, whether it's here in the Northern Irish conflict or anywhere else, one of the things that I have discovered through experiences like this and many other reconciliation processes is that the one thing that you can get people to agree on is that they want to be treated as if they mattered. That's the one thing. And so I'm thinking, okay, this is really, this is, and you know, of course, dignity, <coughs> dignity is that one thing. But you know what, if we stop at understanding each other's differences and leave it at that, I, I, th I think that's a dangerous place to stop. And I think we need to go one step further beyond understanding, e understanding each other's differences to try to come to some common transcendent identity that we can all say, I, I, can, I can work for that. And honestly, I haven't found anything else but dignity that I want, we all want to be treated with dignity. That is the transcendent yearning, human yearning. That's the piece where we can say, this is something we can all rally around. The word dignity came to me much later because I was thinking, oh my gosh, we've got to figure out a way to address these emotional riptides that are wreaking havoc here. We've got to figure out a way to do this, right? But think, imagine with these high-level negotiators, if I were to say to them, okay, I can see that you had a very profound emotional reaction just now to what the other side said. Let's talk about that, right? Well, nobody likes to talk about their emotions, period, especially not these high-level negotiators. So I figured out one day, I know how we can talk about this because I, can, I think I've got what this is. Because if, if I were to put words to this unspoken emotional riptide that was going through, it would sound something like, how dare you treat us this way? How dare you? Don't you see my people are suffering? Don't you see we're human beings? How can you treat us this way? Both sides, both sides. This is the unspoken conversation that was going through the rooms, no matter where I was in the world. And so finally I said, okay, I know what we can do here. If this is about their dignity, this is about being treated as if they didn't matter. And so when I came up with that word, word dignity, you know, it was like this flash of enlightenment for me. I felt like, yes, this is the word that we can use. You know, one of the challenges is you could have a workshop and you could talk about dignity, and then that Palestinian gets stuck in the Gaza gate uh, and just humiliated yet again, right? But as I listened to you speak, I thought to be consciously aware of dignity is like a parent telling your child, when you walk out to a busy street, look to your right and look <laughs> to your left. That's really great. I'm going to borrow that. And yeah. to me, <laughs> I would say it's not about workshops in any area. It's about developing a sense. Mm. It's like before you step out the street, you don't want to get hit. Before you go out in the world, whether it's leaving this classroom and going home, or if you're working in conflict or any of these issues, to recognize how am I treating this other person? Because as you once told me, which you haven't said tonight, that we are hardwired to recognize when our dignity is violated by others but we are not hardwired to recognize when we violate somebody else's dignity. So I would take away from dignity is to say it's like having that second sense. To appreciate, sixth. or sixth sense, to appreciate this is like looking left and right before you stepped into a busy street. That is Am brilliant. I putting myself brilliant. at risk, 
and am I putting others at risk? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you may get hit, but you may cause a pileup that a lot of other people get injured. When I go into a situation and I do, whether it's in a, in a workplace or uh, whatever the organization is, I tell people we're going to work on two levels here. We're going to work at interpersonal dignity honoring, but we're also going to look at the structural issues that are also contributing. And what Tim just pointed out that there's often this competition for victimhood in these conflicts that we're, um, and with Malcolm and Ronnie, you know, they, I think if the, the real final analysis of what happened in that encounter was that they both saw that they were both victims. And they were victims of a dysfunctional political system. A truly dysfunctional political system that pitted them against one another in that way. And like you were saying earlier, they were the ones who were, you know, the victims because they were doing the killing, too. They were the ones responsible for it. So when you, ha you have to look at both. You have to look at the structural indignities that are perpetuated, whether it's something in society, like racism or sexism or homophobia, whatever those structural issues are. That, though, that is equally as important to look at when you're doing a intervention as how you and your former general interacted interpersonally, right? So it's both. We really have to do both. One without the other is, is not going to have a, um, a lasting impact on changing the culture in the, in the relationship. It was the hardest uh, work that I've ever done, and it was the hardest emotional work. It wasn't such, it wasn't so difficult, um, you know, it wasn't as, well, let me put it this way. Working out some of the political issues when I would convene dialogues with parties was basically a piece of cake compared to what it was like listening to these testimonies of people and what they'd been through. So at the end of our first day, uh, and, and it was a BBC television program, so the, everything was being recorded. They, I mean, we had eight cameras on us all the time. And so at the end of the first day, f eight hours worth of filming, we were exhausted, absolutely exhausted. We walked out, um, the facilitation team and then a couple of the producers, and one of the producers said, you know what, we should probably sit down for a while and debrief this. You know how we always debrief things. We should really sit down, talk about what we did that was good, talk about what we did that was not so good, and see how we can improve our um, facilitation for the next day. Makes sense. Archbishop Tutu heard this conversation, and he turned around to us and he said, you are not doing a debriefing. We thought, oh my God, we, we thought we were being so responsible. And he said, nope, he said, he looked at his clock, he said, it's five o'clock, I'm gonna go upstairs and take a nap. And I, why don't you go out and get some fresh air, because you don't need to talk about this work anymore. He said, I, in an hour, I'm gonna come back down, we're gonna go into the drawing room, because this took place in a very nice fancy house outside of Belfast. We're gonna go into the drawing room. We are gonna have cocktails. We are going to play music. We are going to sing. We are going to dance. And every night, we're gonna do the same thing. And we're standing there, what? <laughs> you know, so he's saying we're gonna party every night. In fact, we have to counterbalance the energy in this environment um, so that it doesn't overtake us because it will overtake us. And I, and I hand you that too. I mean, all of you who do this work, we all, you know, we're grappling with these life and death issues. We're struggling with what's the right thing to do. We're struggling with healing. We're struggling with, oh my God, this is so much bigger than us. What should we do, right? We all, I mean, we do agonize over these things, don't we? I mean, let's face it. It's part of our nature also to agonize. But if we don't know how, if we don't have the capacity for joy, and if we don't know how to put a little bit of levity in these situations, we're not gonna be any good for anybody. So, and then the Archbishop, at the end, he's, he's walking up the stairs, and any of you who have ever seen him or know him, he, he knew he got us, right? 
Because when he insisted that we're going to party every single night, he knew he got us. And then he turned around, walked up the stairs, and he said, oh, there's one more thing. And we thought, oh, no, now what? And he said, it's our duty to be joyful. Sums it right up, doesn't it?